Hi everybody. This is uh, uh, unfortunately the best way to communicate at the moment. And so I appreciate you uh, visiting the church website and uh, taking some time uh, to uh, look at this. A couple items of housekeeping for First Christian Church Rocky Mount. I think it's wise to refrain from assembling together, at least for the near future. Um, as someone who, like many of you, has missed a very few Sundays, uh, I can tell you I really hate this. Um, I don't like it at all, but uh, I think it's what we have to do at the present time. Um, all of the uh, folks who know uh, how these things work are pretty clear. Um, somebody mentioned that they did know about a church that met in their parking lot and they were going to be worshiping from their cars. Um, and that sounds great. And I'd love to uh, do something like that if we could pull it off. Um, and I'd love to see your beautiful faces. Um, but if we do that, it does mean the cost of someone having to sacrifice time and exposure to set up uh, speakers and microphones and infrastructure. Um, and it would probably expose people to risk that uh, they don't need to be out uh, and doing those things. And I'm willing to be wrong, but if our decisions put um, even one person in harm's way, I think we ought not uh, tempt that. It could have devastating consequences that we might not even know for, for a while. So uh, as for now, I'm going to continue to offer twice a week, Sunday mornings and Wednesday afternoons, a time to be together for devotion and prayer. Um, I think a prayer request or an announcement went out, uh, an email went out this morning uh, from church, and those will continue. Um, if any of you has any need, financial, spiritual, emotional, you just want somebody to talk with, uh, on the phone, um, our church leadership and I, we are here for you. Um, several church members have asked for and received uh, financial assistance, and if you need it, anything at all, please ask. Um, uh, we have the resources available to reach out to you and help. Um, our church has faced a lot of hardships in our history, uh, and each time we have emerged resilient and strong, every time. Um, and we will surely do the same in our current circumstances. So um, let's stay in touch, please. And exchange the calls and emails like you've been doing. Um, and uh, uh, let's be together. I invite you now to uh, a time of prayer uh, before we read our scripture together and have a lesson. Gracious God, as we move through this Lenten journey, uh, albeit to uncharted territories, we ask you to heighten our attentiveness to your insistent power, and your presence, your spirit, your grace. Show us what we need to see in our lives, um, both to do what's pleasing in your sight and to change what does not honor you. May this be a time of reflection and repentance, confession and forgiveness, death and resurrection, even in the midst of a journey toward Easter. Show us what it looks like to be faithful. Strengthen us to follow the path of justice and peace. To speak out when we need to. To hold back when we can. Just one step at a time, even in the comfort or discomfort of our homes. We ask you to bring us to a place of wholeness and hope. To make us a witness for your love, even if it's just to those in confinement with us. Help us to get along. Help us to listen and to love. We ask you to be a source of compassion for us, God, and acceptance as we, as we do this, to give us capacity to listen to those with whom we disagree and to respond in kindness, not in anger. We ask, God, that you fulfill your promise to give us your Holy Spirit to guide our thoughts and our actions, what we say, what we do, Help us to look for those who are hurting, to seek out those who need, and to meet the challenge. Support us, God, with your love and your grace, that in all things we can be instruments of your love. Amen. 
So Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself, and he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, especially like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. We talked on Sunday uh, about how this process works. Jesus spoke. His friends walked towards Jerusalem with him. He told stories. His words were later written down and shared. And in times like these, we crave them, and we're grateful to hear them again. The two men in this story uh, who went up to the temple to pray, they have backgrounds. One, a Pharisee, the other, a tax collector. We assume we know who the good guy is and who the bad guy is. But those hearing Jesus tell this story for the first time on his way to the cross, on his way to Jerusalem, walking together, traveling together, heard it differently than we do. Pharisees were respected leaders. They made sure the temple community did everything right. They kept the rules. They were well-meaning. They were faithful people. Some Pharisees, like the one in this story, were good people, but they also acted like they knew it. And they wanted everybody else to see what they did, and they were hypocritical. And they missed the point of doing good and being good in the first place. But Jesus had a passion to make sure his disciples didn't remain ignorant. And he showed that passion by telling this story. God, I thank you. I'm not like these other people. I give a tenth of all my income. That's the right thing to do. He's a good person. But then the contrast with the other man, the tax collector, who openly confessed in public he was a sinner. And everybody heard it, and they all agreed, yep, I told you so. And tax collectors, see, they were collaborators with Rome. They were crooked. They were shady. They took advantage of people. They played a role in their culture by being a group that everybody could look down on. And we, in our culture, appreciate somebody to point at. I may have my faults, but at least I'm not like that person or those people. But this tax collector blew that stereotype out of the water because he knew who he was and what he was and whose he was. He knew that his relationship with God was a mess and he wanted it to be better. He wasn't trying to impress God or anybody else. His prayer was not a resume to show off. It was a plea. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It is likely that he knew that he was reciting the 51st Psalm. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Blot out my transgressions, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. We prayed that same prayer on Ash Wednesday. Four weeks ago, it seems like four years ago. And this was an Ash Wednesday prayer 2,000 years before our service a month ago. And his prayer wasn't bragging, it was begging, it was real, because it was confessional. This tax collector was a sinner, and he knew it. And he was honest enough to confess it to God right there in front of everybody, and he asked for grace. He asked for mercy. He asked for forgiveness. And the purpose wasn't recognition by God, it was reconciliation with God, bringing two closer that had been apart. I think it's not by accident that Jesus said that the tax collector stood apart. He was physically separated from his faith community, and he asked for reconciliation, to be brought close. And Jesus said that's exactly what he got. And the shock everybody listening to Jesus must have felt as he told this story, walking on his way to the cross, he says, I want to tell you that tax collector went home justified. He was right with God. They were brought back together. And erasers on pencils had to be invented for moments like that. Because every preconceived notion, every hard and fast definition of what it meant to be faithful to God had to be rewritten, redefined, revised. The Pharisee didn't go home justified, and I'll tell you why, says Jesus. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. <sighs> Our tendency when we hear this parable is to connect with the tax collector. 
But I think Jesus told this story because people like us, the ones who walk 98% in line, doing the things we're supposed to do, doing right, being the way we should be, we pretend that the other 2% doesn't exist. And if we're honest, as we walk toward Jerusalem with Jesus, we're much more like the Pharisee. We want to be the one who confesses and is forgiven. But Jesus wants his disciples and us to examine the Pharisee as if we were in his shoes. Are we too spiritually wise to realize the times that we're spiritually blind? We think we can trust in ourselves. We think we can trust our own goodness. Our spiritual practices are about feeling good more than they are about being right with God, bringing things together. And we're allowing a gap, even if it's tiny, to exist between us and God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. It's not about ourselves. It's only about connecting with God. And unfortunately, also like the Pharisee, we can be incredibly harsh on other people, and they may have a teeny tiny little gap too, and boy, we want to exploit it and talk all about it. We can be so harsh on other people, writing them off as lost causes or glaring sinners. Thank God I'm not like them, rather than seeing them as the frail, fragile people they are, just like you and I are. True spiritual insight belongs to the humble. And as they walk toward Jesus' death in Jerusalem, as they face a global pandemic, the good news is that the gap no matter how large or small, can be closed. True spiritual insight belongs to the humble. It belongs to those who can recognize their limitations, who can see how messed up they are and then act to do something about it. We're living in a messed up time. And you and I need to do everything that we can not to live messed up lives. Spiritual discipline still matters. God. So, we aren't always loving, but our time calls for love. We aren't very kind sometimes, but our neighbors need kindness as much as they do the daily essentials. We are thoughtless, we are arrogant, we are uncaring, we can even be very cruel. But our common circumstances are begging us for mercy and grace, kind of like that one who went up to the temple to pray and begged God for mercy and grace. Thankfully, the good news this Lent is the same as the good news for every previous Lent. God is the source of the things that we need. God is the source of all these things that we need. And if we were to count only on our own righteousness, our skills, our goodness, our efforts to save us, we'd be in more trouble than we think we are. But here's the good news, church. God is not grading us on our righteousness or how we follow the rules. The rule following is a good thing. God is not grading us on how merciful we are either, though our expressions of mercy are very important. It's not our obedience that makes us holy. It's not how loving or civil or kind we are that counts in God's eyes. It doesn't matter what we post or leave unposted on social media. It's not if we get the point, whether we recognize our sins or confess them to God like the tax collector did. None of that matters as much as God. God's mercy and grace is what counts. God is the only one that counts. And the one who recognizes our proper place in that relationship suddenly can find himself or herself closing that gap. The one who recognizes our proper relationship, our role in the story, our character, after whom we should model our behavior, will understand how good this news is. Prayer is confessing need and asking for what God has, for who God is, and for what we don't have and what we are not. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's begging God to give what God craves to bestow. Create in me a clean heart and a right spirit. 
And Jesus knew this, and that's why he told the story. Just a few days from telling this story about our need for forgiveness, he stretches out his arms on the cross. The consequences of politics and religion and sin colliding together all did him in. And even in his dying and in his rising from the dead, he makes forgiveness and grace so abundantly clear that the world could not help but take a look. But he gave his disciples and us a taste of that, just a glimpse of God's mercy as he walked. And he told a story about two men going to the temple to pray. So as you and I continue our Lenten journey, our walk toward a deeper relationship with God, a, a time of trying to close that gap, I invite you to pray for mercy. As we struggle through this, and it is likely to get worse, I invite us all to plead God that God will help us become merciful in the midst of it. Because surviving all this hardship and coming out at the other end of it, exactly the same people we were before, that's an awful lot like two men going up to the temple to pray.